Let's begin with a word of prayer. Lord God, we come before you today and acknowledge that you are the the King of kings and Lord of lords, that you are the, the founder of nations and the God of all creation. Help us as we come together today to give you thanks for what you have given us, to give you thanks for the land that we have and the, the support that we have with one another. But let us always turn to you in praise, for you are the one who does all good things. We pray in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Please stand if you're able and join us in the call to worship. Praise the Lord, all you nations. Praise him, all, all you peoples. peoples. For great is his love towards us. The faithfulness, faithfulness of, of the Lord, Lord endures forever. forever. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Please join us in singing This Is My Father's World, hymn number 144.
So Jerry at this time has special music. prayer. O oh God, we turn to you today and we give you thanks for the blessings of life, for family, for friendship, for liberty, and for justice. Lord God, we give you thanks that we do live in a society, a country where freedom to come together and worship is treasured. And we pray that we would see that, that our commitment as, as people of the kingdom of heaven includes being part of the kingdom of earth as well. That we would strive to be good citizens, that we would be, strive to, to speak truth and justice where it needs to be spoken of. 
Help us to stand up for those who are oppressed. Help us to stand up for those who need your protection. Lord God, we pray today for our leaders, regardless of, of which side of the political spectrum they may be, they have been placed in office at this time by the will of the people. And so we lift them up in prayer. We lift them up for your guidance and wisdom for your understanding to rest upon their hearts. Lord God, we give you thanks for the individuals of our country who may not hold political office, but are leaders in our communities, uh, who are supportive in civic groups and, and in churches. Lord God, help us to see that each and every individual that forms a nation is part of that life of the nation. And although we may be small, as individuals, we may not be able to reach very far. Help us to hold hand in hand and to, to pray for our nation, to lift our nation up in prayer daily, that, that we might see your providence at work as people did in days of old. Lord God, we also lift up the names of those who are dear to us today. We pray for Don and Delilah, for Megan, Caroline, and snow for the many unspoken requests that are dear to our hearts the names also printed in our bulletin be with them today help us to be with them in spirit and in truth as well help us to support one another whether in times of sadness or times of joy and help us to celebrate together what you are doing in us and through us in jesus christ's holy name we pray amen I invite you to join me in singing the Battle Hymn of the Republic, hymn number 717. And please stand as you are able. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord.
Lord Jesus Christ. We missed that. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. And then you'll read the scripture. <laughs> Isaiah 42, 1 through 4. But here is my servant, the one I uphold, my chosen, who brings me delight. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring justice to the nations. He won't cry out or shout out loud or make his voice heard in public. He won't break a bruised reed. He won't extinguish a faint wick, but he will surely bring justice. He won't be extinguished or broken until he has established justice in the land. The coastlands await his teaching. Let us take a moment for prayer. <coughs> Lord God, I ask that you open our eyes and ears to receive what you have for us today. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. How many of you have seen the musical 1776? Raise your hand. Oh, we're going to have to have a movie night. <laughs> 1776, uh, the musical came out, I believe, in the late 70s. Uh, it is a story about the founding of our nation. And in it, there are some very very humorous moments where, where three of the main founding fathers are together arguing about what our national bird should be. And, and uh, the eagle is lifted up as one and the turkey is lifted up as, as the other option. And it's, it's just uh, hearing Benjamin Franklin talking about how noble the turkey is and everything. It, it's, it's humorous and it's, it's lighthearted. And then there's moments that are deep and even dark. A, a uh, courier comes with news for the, the, the Congress that is meeting to, to draft this Declaration of Independence. Uh, he comes with news from the war front and he starts singing about his, his brothers on the battlefield and his mother, his mama, that, that soldier who is dying, crying out for his mama. And oh, it is chilling and haunting. But the most haunting song of all, in my opinion, is when the, the founding fathers are arguing about whether or not the phrase, all men are created equal should be included because in the eyes of some of the delegates there, not all men are created equal. And some of the founding fathers are arguing that slavery should be abolished from day one. If they are going to be a land of liberty and justice and freedom for all, they mean for all, and they want to abolish slavery from that day one of the nation. And they're voted down. And a senator from the South begins to sing about the hypocrisy of the North. About how they like their trade and their money. And how they like their rum. But this triangle of trade would not exist without slavery. And it's haunting and it's chilling because, hey, I grew up in the North. I grew up thinking that the people in the South were to blame for the Civil War and, and things like that. But there was a circle. There was a cycle. And there were people on all sides who were to blame for our nation's faults. But our nation did stand up for liberty, and justice. I often take my vacation at the 4th of July. 
uh, mostly because I have a, a family tradition and I like being with family on the 4th. And I don't usually preach anything to do with politics, but I think it's safe to preach about the politics of the 1700s. Uh, I won't be stepping on too many toes here. Uh, the, the truth is, you know, when I go to an example, that I almost always go to the word uh, that we have before us, the Bible. But there are truths that can be told from history as well. And those of you who really know me know that at heart, I am a historian as well. I just wish I could get the names and the dates right. <laughs> I want to tell you some stories today about the founding faith of our fathers. Uh, not to lift our nation up and worship our nation. Uh, I had a colleague from seminary who, in his first ministry, came to his congregation and saw the flags up at the front of the church and thought to himself, well, that's almost idolatry. We have flags of our nation in the front of the church where we should only have the worship of God. And so he took the flags and he moved them to the back of his sanctuary from week one. And amazing, on Sunday morning, they were back in the front. And he'd march them back to the back each Sunday morning. And this struggle went on for months because to some of the members of the congregation, they fought for the freedoms that they believe in. And this foreign pastor, because he was from Scotland, wasn't respecting, you know who I'm talking about now, uh, <laughs> uh, was not respecting the tradition and the honor of the congregation. Uh, it was after your time, I'm sorry. I see, I see Tony shaking his head, he doesn't know. Uh, but that's okay, that's not the important part. The part that I'm, I'm pointing to here is that there is a fine line, a balance between who we are as members of the kingdom of heaven and who we are as members of the kingdom of the United States of America. The United States, that term actually came about, um, it used to be called the United Colonies of America, but they wanted to separate themselves. If they were declaring independence, they wanted to, to, uh, to separate themselves. They didn't want to be called colonies anymore. They wanted to be called states. But the truth is they were anything but united. We had differing opinions, different social classes, different, differing uh, views of issues like slavery and trade. We had different views of the king. Not everyone was opposed to being a British subject. In 1774, when those founding fathers came together for the first time, it was not to draft a declaration of independence. It was to write a letter of plea the king. You see, they were beginning to be taxed by uh, parliament. But the colonies were under agreement not with the British parliament. They were under agreement with the king. And the king could do what he wanted with the colonies. But the colonists wanted to remind King George that they were not subjects to the government of Great Britain. They were subjects to the king and wanted the king to understand that if they were going to be taxed, all they wanted was a person in the parliament so that their voice could be heard. That's all they were going to do. And if King George had not been a little, uh, uh, he is known as Mad King George, uh, if he wasn't a little crazy, he could have headed off this whole revolution. You see, the North and the South distrusted one another. Virginia and Rhode Island had an argument that lasted for decades to the point where uh, the reason we have a Congress and a Senate are because of an argument between Virginia and Rhode Island. We don't just have one uh, House of Representatives, we have two because the two of them couldn't agree upon how the states and the federal government should work. And so a great compromise came about because they couldn't get along. 
if George, King George, had just played off of the differences that we had and started to talk to the South and say, uh, pointed out, well, you don't want them as your partners. You need to trust in me as your king. He could have separated the colonies. He had the authority to remove any ties of unity. But instead, he sent soldiers to attack these belligerent colonists. In that first meeting in 1774, when they came together, one of the congressmen said that they should start with prayer. And this began a argument. You see, you had... Uh, the descendants of the Puritans, and you had uh, some early Baptists, and you had uh, Congregationalists, and you had Unitarians, and you even had some Catholics here. And there was argument amongst them, well, who should we say has the authority, spiritual authority, to, to speak and to pray for our gathering here? And one of them stood up and said, well, I don't care which denomination says the prayer as long as the man is a man of integrity and a patriot. And so they got a Presbyterian minister <laughs> to come in and say a prayer. And he read from the book of Psalms and his prayer changed the heart of that gathering of people. They were trying to find some common ground to make a plea to the king. And instead, that prayer triggered something within their hearts. That instead of a plea to the king, they should be appealing to the king of kings. And that they should be on their knees in prayer. And so each state representative went back home and, and had a proclamation that before, as soon as is logistically possible, you need to have a day of prayer in your state to pray for wisdom and guidance, not from our king, not from our senators, but from God. And so the independence sparked off with prayer. Now, when they came back together, here's, here's another bit of a story. John Adams. John Adams came from a state that had a state institutionalized religion. There was one church that was allowed in the state of Massachusetts. Only one church. If you belonged to another faith, you had to register with the state to have permission to worship and to gather together. And if you think that this is, is something that was just in the, the 1600s, no, this continued on until after the founding of the, uh, of the Constitution of the United States. It was a decade after the founding of the Constitution before uh, Massachusetts finally lowered their regulations on church mandate, a state mandated church. You were obligated to go to their church, and if you didn't, you had to pay taxes. Every single member of the state, whether you belonged to that church or not, had to pay a tax which supported the pastor's salary. That's how things worked back then. And John Adams wrote letters and articles uh, explaining why this was a good thing, because the state needed the services of the church. But somewhere along the way, when the Constitution was being founded, a group of Baptists came forward with a suggestion. They wanted an amendment to the Constitution. They wanted the, the state to say that the state, and, and I don't know this word for word, you might be a better historian than I am, that the state shall not mandate a state religion, that each person should be able to worship uh, and be free to worship as they see fit, 
that the state should not censor uh, uh, a gathering and free speech, the ability to come together, whether that be in religion or social group, to come together, that they should have the freedom of speech, the freedom of the press, and that if you have a grievance against the government, the government has to listen to it. That you have a right as an American citizen, if you believe that your government isn't doing what is right, you have the right to come to be heard by your government without fear of punishment. These Baptists were laughed out of the uh, Congress. Their proposal was absurd to them. But John Adams, who is a person who, who proposed a state-mandated government, got together with those leaders and a few other founding fathers and discussed with them the benefits of freedom of church and state. That, that, that there should be the, the right of conscience in each and every individual to worship as they see fit. So they, he came at the next session, and he, with his authority, as one of the leaders of this Congressional Congress, Constitutional Congress, uh, proposed that First Amendment to the United States Constitution. And after a lot of debate, it was ratified. You see, here is a man who believes that there's only one true expression of faith, seeing that faith is something that has to be between you and your maker. This is that founding faith of our fathers. Then there is Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson was a, a deist. He did not believe in uh, the Christian Bible. He did not believe in miracles. He did not believe in angels. There is some debate as to what his true view of God was. Some believe that, that he did have a belief in God and a personal faith, uh, but it was more the view that God created everything like a great watchmaker. And he wound it up, and he set it on the table. The universe is sitting on his table, and it's running the way that he wanted it to. And that was his view. Other people believe that he didn't believe in God at all. But there is a story about how when he was president, that one day he was walking with a prayer book under his arm, and he was stopped by a friend, and after their mutual greeting, he was asked, well, Mr. Jefferson, where are you going? He said, I'm going to church. And the man said, but you don't believe in all of that. And he responded, this government, and this is a paraphrase, I, I uh, don't have it word for word what he said, but he basically said, this government is founded on the best religious principles that are out there. And that if we are to support our government, and if we are su to support the ideals of freedom and justice and liberty, then we have a duty to support our churches as well. Good day, sir. So the one founding father who, who definitely did not have similar views to, to a great majority of them saw the value of personal faith, saw the value of, of supporting uh, the ideals of liberty and justice. And it's one of the reasons why I am glad that I live in the country that I do. Paul, tying back into the Bible, Paul lived in a time, the Apostle Paul lived in a time when there was not liberty and justice. Rome was an advanced society. There was liberty and justice for some. But they had slavery, and they had a vast uh, uh, class divide. 
If you were part of the elite, if you were part of the, the ruling class, if you were part of the business class, you had certain rights and privileges. But if you were part of the lower class, the working class, you did not enjoy those same privileges. And if you had a differing faith, you would not be guaranteed even the protection of life. That you could be put to death at the whim of the emperor. This passage that I'm about to read was written when Nero, one of the most infamous Caesars in history, was in power. And so this passage is not about uh, uh, following the government if you agree with the government. It is about the fact that, that God is sovereign, that he is at work in righteous government and even in unrighteous government. Here now from the book of Romans chapter 13. Every person should place themselves under the authority of government. There isn't any authority unless it comes from God, and the authorities that are there have been put in place by God. So anyone who opposes the authority is standing against what God has established. People who take this kind of stand will get punished. The authorities don't frighten people who are doing right things. Rather, they frighten people who are doing wrong. Would you rather not be afraid of authority? Do what is right. You will receive its approval. It is God's servant given for your benefit. But if you do wrong, be afraid, because it doesn't have weapons to enforce the law for nothing. It is God's servant put in place to carry out punishment on those who do what is wrong. That is why it is necessary to place yourself under the government's authority, not only to avoid God's punishment, but also for the sake of your conscience. You should also pay taxes for the same reason, because the authorities are God's assistants, concerned with this very thing. So pay everything what you owe them. Pay taxes you owe. Pay the duties you are charged. Give respect to those you should, and honor those you should honor. Now, this reading is one that does cause challenges. What if you're living in North Korea? What if you are living in uh, Stalinist Russia during the time of Great Oppression? What then? You should see that God is still sovereign. In all of the stories that I told you this morning, things could have gone one way or the other. John Adams could have said, nope, it's my way or the highway. The people of the South, uh, the governors from South Carolina and Georgia could have said, nope, it's my way or the highway. The people of Virginia could have said, nope, it's my view of God or, or nothing at all. But people worked together for a common goal. They were vastly different. The North often looked down on the South because it started as a penal colony. The South looked at the North as, as arrogant and pretentious. The, the smaller states looked on suspicion at the larger states because they saw them as greedy. But when people come together with a unified goal and acknowledge that God is in charge and strive to do the best for their nation to honor God, then there is harmony and God's work can be done. I do not mean by any extent that our nation is perfect. I do not believe that there is any nation, nation on this earth that does it all right. Just as I don't believe that there is any denomination in Christendom that does everything right. But when we seek God's guidance, when we keep God as our foundation and our guide, then we can be assured that we don't have anything to fear. 
We do have liberty and the ability to stand up. And there will be times when we have to stand up and say, this is righteousness and this is not. But with that founding faith of our fathers, we have blessings in our country and we should never take them for granted. Now, a voice of warning, there are people in our government who want to wipe, let me rephrase that, there are people in our, our nation who want to whitewash our history, who want to erase religion from that founding of our nation. And there were people in the founding of our nation who were not Christian, whose views of God were greatly different from our own. But we cannot dismiss the founding cornerstone of our nation, that it was built upon Judeo-Christian values of life, liberty, and justice for all. One day we might get closer to that credo than we are today. But until then, let us be a voice of truth and justice and liberty for all. Let us pray. Lord God, again I give you thanks that in these 200 and so, some odd years that you have had your hand on our nation, that you have shown your providence. Uh, we could talk more about, about George Washington and, and the miracles he saw, your hand at work in the founding of our nation. Let us give you thanks for the blessings that we have. Let us see that we are subjects of a nation for a reason and give honor to those to whom honor is due. But also let us treasure the fact that we have been given freedom and to use it wisely. For while all things are permissible, not all things are wise. Give us your wisdom, your insight, your understanding. In Jesus Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. At this time, I invite the ushers forward for the taking of our tithes and our offering. Please rise and join me in singing the doxology to our Lord. Praise God from Lord, we give you thanks for the blessings that you have given us, and we pray that you would receive these gifts that we offer to you. May they be used for the upbuilding of your kingdom here on earth. In Jesus Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. 
You may be seated. Part of the blessings of our nation is that we are able to come together and practice our faith. And as part of that practice, we retell the story of our faith. On the night in which Jesus Christ was betrayed, he took bread, the bread of the Passover meal, and he broke it. And he passed it to his disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body which has been broken for you. It is the tradition of our church that you do not need to be a member in order to partake of the table of our Lord. Just as Jesus did not forbid Judas from that table, I will forbid no one. But I do ask that we come together and prepare our hearts and minds for this act of worship. Lord God, we give you thanks for the blessings of life and the truth that the, the true Lord of Lord, the true King of Kings came and was not an authoritarian, was not a dictator, but was a servant to all, willing to give even his body and blood for the forgiveness of all humankind. Help us as we come before the table today to prepare our hearts to find peace and forgiveness in you. Amen. I invite the ushers forward. Bread for millennia has been a symbol of life. Take the life of Christ into you. Take and eat. In a similar manner, after the supper, he took the cup, that cup of the, the Passover meal, which pointed to the coming of the Messiah, and gave it a new meaning. He said, take and drink. This cup is the new covenant for the forgiveness of sin. Every time you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me.
The cup represents the sacrifice that our Lord Jesus made, that he allowed his blood to be shed that we might find forgiveness. Take and drink. After the Passover meal, the disciples gathered together uh, around in that upper room and sang hymns uh, until Jesus went out to the, the Garden of Gethsemane. And so I invite you to join us hand in hand and share together singing, Bless Be the Tie that Bye. Go in peace. Amen. Amen. Amen.